uh, we're really uh, uh, so very pleased uh, to have our uh, three of our uh, very distinguished former directors of the Africa Center uh, back with us today, uh, uh, partly in honor of uh, this being our 20th anniversary year, uh, and especially uh, to appreciate um, uh, the class of 2019 and our emerging security sector leaders uh, to share with us some perspective on strategic leadership uh, from their uh, very diverse uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, uh, the one commonality, in fact, being uh, former director of the Africa Center. And so I'm going to introduce them uh, in order of their tenure uh, uh, as my uh, methodology here. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, give the bios for all three of our, uh, our panel, and, uh, and then we'll have a, a bit of a conversation uh, up here on the podium, uh, and then we'll open up uh, for your comments and questions uh, and uh, discussion as well. So uh, please uh, be uh, thinking about uh, uh, what you would like uh, to take advantage of, of our guests. Uh, we have with us this morning uh, Dr. Nancy Walker, uh, who was the director of the Africa Center uh, from its founding in 1999 to 2003. Uh, and she came to the Africa Center with a long and distinguished career uh, as a civil servant uh, in the Pentagon, uh, and uh, 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 also included uh, being the director of the Office of African Affairs uh, and also the UN branch chief at the Office of Peacekeeping uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, she uh, subsequently was also the first director of the Atlantic Council's Ansari Africa Center, one of our think tanks uh, here in Washington, which uh, uh, does a lot of important policy work uh, on Africa. She has also taught U.S. foreign policy at the Elliott School uh, of International Studies at George Washington University, uh, national security decision making at Bilkent University in Ankara, Turkey, uh, and African studies at Ankara University. And so she has a, a very unique uh, perspective uh, to bring uh, from her time uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, in Europe, and in Africa. Uh, in 2013, Dr. Walker established Nancy's Wonderful Women uh, to provide mentoring and leadership development opportunities for women uh, across generations and professional fields. Uh, she holds a Doctorate of Philosophy in Politics from Oxford University and degrees from Harvard and Radcliffe Colleges, uh, as well as many other distinguished uh, honors and awards. Uh, we're so pleased uh, to have Dr. Walker back uh, with us uh, today. She was uh, succeeded as the director of the Africa Center by General Carton, uh, Carlton Fulford, Jr., uh, retired, uh, who served as our director from 2003 uh, to 2006. Uh, but prior to that, uh, he served in uh, very many distinguished uh, and significant uh, command uh, responsibilities uh, for uh, the United States. He was Deputy Commander-in-Chief of United States European Command uh, from 2000 to 2002. Uh, he was the Director of the Joint Staff. Uh, he was a Commander of the U.S. Marine, Force, uh, Marine Corps Forces and Bases in the Pacific. Uh, he was also Commanding General of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force, uh, and the 4th Marine Expeditionary Brigade, if we're getting that correctly. Uh, and commanding officer uh, in Operation Desert Storm and so many other distinguished uh, uh, battle uh, responsibilities. Uh, he has uh, uh, the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, two bronze oak leaf covers, the Silver Star, the Legion of Merit, uh, the uh, Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, the Gold Star, uh, pretty much every uh, distinguished award uh, I think that our military can bestow. And so it was truly a great uh, privilege uh, for the Africa Center to have him uh, uh, as uh, the next director uh, following Dr. Walker, and uh, a delight uh, to have him back with us uh, today. Uh, he, uh, in fact, also holds a Master of Science uh, from uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, uh, which is in New York, and he is also a graduate of the National Defense University uh, ICAF School, the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, uh, next door to us here. Uh, and uh, we're also pleased then to have our third director uh, of the Africa Center, Ambassador Peter Chavez, uh, who served from 2006 uh, to 2008 uh, following General Fulford. Uh, he served for almost 40 years in the U.S. government, uh, first as a Peace Corps volunteer and then 34 years with the State Department, uh, uh, including uh, service as ambassador to Malawi, uh, ambassador to Sierra Leone, 
uh, political advisor to the commander of U.S. forces uh, in Europe, uh, amongst other things. Uh, he was director of the Office of Southern African Affairs and of West African Affairs uh, in the State Department here in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, so he had a long and distinguished career in our foreign service uh, and was recognized uh, for outstanding service uh, by the Department of State uh, with many awards uh, as well. Uh, and so we are really privileged, in fact, uh, to have a, a, a panel uh, that represents a senior civilian uh, uh, colleague, uh, a senior military officer at the highest levels, and one of our most distinguished uh, former diplomats on the continent, uh, all as former directors of the Africa Center, and I think indicative of what we still hope to embody in terms of being a very multidisciplinary, uh, multi-sectorally uh, approach uh, to African security and peace uh, and development on the continent. Uh, and so uh, please join me in welcoming them back to the Africa Center and with us this morning. Um, so, so we're going to start this morning uh, just with some reflections on strategic leadership uh, and uh, some uh, thoughts from, from our former directors on, uh, on uh, their uh, vantage point, uh, uh, both uh, from their time as uh, director, but uh, uh, as or more importantly, uh, over their careers and, and the various facets uh, of their engagement uh, with the continent and with other roles and responsibilities, uh, uh, some of which uh, uh, may not have been African-focused, but uh, also have had uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, leadership uh, responsibilities and, and requirements. And, and so uh, the first question that I, that I wanted to, to simply pose uh, uh, and uh, get some opening thoughts uh, uh, from, from each of you on is um, uh, what are the, the values that uh, if you would um, highlight or, or recommend uh, as being uh, most foundational to uh, approaching leadership, uh, whether in the context of a uh, security sector or, in fact, uh, moving uh, in and out of, of various roles uh, of, of responsibility uh, as, uh, as colleagues progress through their careers. Uh, so, Nancy, sure. I'd be happy to start. Maybe we'll start with you. First of all, let me thank Kate and the whole team. It is a pleasure and an honor to be back here at the Africa Center. It has been a morning of memories and reunions, and it gives me enormous pleasure to see how far the center has come in these last 20 years. One of the things um, that I am particularly proud to see is the number of women in this room. I can assure you at our very first senior leader seminar in November of 1999, the numbers were not quite so balanced. So bravo, bravo to the center team and heartfelt welcome to all of you. Um, Martin Agwai was a participant at the very first senior leader seminar in Dakar back in 1999. So he too can give you some reflections on how the center has evolved. Kate, you asked about qualities and values of leaders. One that is incredibly important to me is trust and how you establish trust among people who will be working with you and for you. And I think about the trust that was needed when we established the Africa Center. Um, one of the things that I am particularly proud of is that we created a program that was honored and valued and trusted by colleagues on the continent. And one of the ways we did that was by listening and by saying everyone's opinions matter and taking it very seriously. So you develop trust, not just by being trusting, but by giving demonstrations of that. And listening and sincere communication is a critical important, critically important part of that. Another value is empowering the people who work for you. Leadership is not just telling people what to do. Leadership is learning who works with you and for you, what their skills are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and how you as a leader can help people to improve, how you can highlight and feature. And I think that's an incredible, also an important one. And then there is the important leadership value and quality and role that you have of mentoring the next generation. And this is something that I started in the Pentagon as a young civilian. I did not know anything about how the United States Department of Defense worked. And certainly when I started in the Office of African Affairs, many of you have heard me tell this story before, I would have failed a geography test. I came in not knowing. But one of the things that I benefited from was 
the values that our military has of identifying and mentoring leadership in the next generation. And early on, I benefited from a lieutenant colonel, an Army JAG officer, and a lieutenant colonel logistics officer. And as I moved up, my mentors started to have stars on their shoulders, and I learned. And I was incredibly grateful for the time and investment and belief in me that people had, and that is now our responsibility. Um, Kate talked about, I just started a program a few years ago called Nancy's Wonderful Women. It is about identifying and creating the conditions for women to mentor each other. So the values, mentoring, and being very, very, that's not telling people what to do. It's also about listening. I'll stop there, but I have plenty more to add. Uh, thank you, Nancy. I think um, as we continue the conversation, uh, I, uh, I like your uh, exam leading by example and uh, sharing some personal experience uh, uh, from your time of, of service in the Pentagon. And so I encourage uh, General Fulford and Ambassador Chavez uh, to weave in a few uh, personal uh, stories as well um, and uh, uh, to continue to unpack uh, this concept of mentoring uh, and uh, what role that's had in your own uh, professional development and career and, and tangibly what could that look like uh, uh, for colleagues here and thinking about to those who will come after them. But General Fulford, your, your thoughts on values for Am I, leadership. Yes, I'm working. Good. Um, first of all, thank you for including me in this presentation with these distinguished leaders on this panel. Um, I enjoyed a brief time here at the Africa Center, uh, but during that time uh, was mentored by Dr. Gilpin and, and Matt and others uh, and learned to love the Africa continent and believe in the challenge of security for the nations of Africa. So I want to start my comments, first of all, by congratulating you on being here. The fact that your nations chose you says something about you, about one, what you have done in your nation up to this point, and two, expectations that your country has for you going forward in the future. That's important, and you need to recognize that and think about it. Uh, can you measure up to those expectations? Uh, do you want to measure up to those expectations? Uh, those are opportunities that you will have to think about and discuss while you're here. Another point I want to make is that the greatest learning that occurs in this seminar is your discussions with each other. Uh, the Africa Center will provide a framework. They will pro provide topics. Uh, but you are the experts on your nation and on security challenges in the Africa continent. And your discussions with each other about what works and what doesn't work is extremely important. And I encourage you to do that, not only in formal meetings such as this, but at lunch and other informal opportunities. Uh, get with a African friend and, and say, uh, how are things in your country? How are they working? Uh, how can we do things differently to strengthen ours? Uh, that's the major advantage of this course. I offer two uh, thoughts to get us started about uh, values or traits of leaders. Um, one, you need to be a visionary. Not accept things as they are, but envision how you think things should be. Uh, you will have the time to think about that while you're here and develop. And I encourage you, if you're taking notes or a journal, uh, try to write down what your vision of your country would be in the next 10, 15 years in the time frame in which you will 
evolve into a major strategic leader. So be a visionary, think, and then try to express those visions in, in words that, that, that mean something. The second thing I would ask you to be as a leader is bold. Uh, you need to be able to take steps. You need to be able to make decisions. They're not always popular. They're not always received uh, in, in the best light. But as a leader, you have responsibility, and your nation and your leaders are putting in, in your shoulders the responsibility to make decisions, to be bold, and to do what you think is right. So as you develop your vision for your country and you commit yourself to bold action to try to bring in whatever way you can that vision to, into being, uh, you will be on the right path of being the kind of leader that your country envisioned when they sent you here. Thank you. Just, just before Ambassador Chavez uh, chimes in, I wonder, General Fulford, uh, is there an anecdote of uh, a time you were challenged to, to be visionary um, in any one of your uh, leadership moments? Um, growing up in the military and in the Marine Corps, uh, we view ourselves as the smallest service, and we're always uh, have less and have to do more with less than anybody else, but we always do it better. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's the organization that I was part of. Um, I think as I grew older, I came to realize that we as Marines can't do it ourselves. Uh, we need other people. We need to be able to work with other people. We need to be able to work with civilian leaders. We need to be able to work with other services. Uh, and the way you do that is, is you try to understand other people, their goals, their vision, and how yours and theirs can be brought together uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, uh, specifically, I would go back to uh, to the Africa continent and the security of Africa. Um, it's not always a top priority for leaders in the United States. They don't understand, one, your challenges, and two, uh, the possibilities that Africa brings for you. So a big part for this center and for leaders who do understand, is to try to, to, to help others understand this vision and the importance of what Africa means to the world today. So I offer that as, as a challenge for us, but also enlist your assistance as we go forward. Well, I want to add. Uh to what's already been said about how much of a pleasure it is to be back and to see the Africa Center prospering. Um, I consider the four years that I spent at the center, two as the deputy director and two as the director, uh, to be uh, four of the most fulfilling years of my service uh, in the United States government. Uh, and to see that it is still doing so well and is, is attracting such a high quality of participants uh, is really, really very, very gratifying. Um, enough, perhaps, has already been said about the need for you as leaders uh, to empower those uh, around you. Um, but I don't think enough can be said about the importance of that as an element of leadership. Uh, I don't care what level at which you may be leading. Is it a small office? Uh, is it a battalion? Uh, is it a foreign mission? Whatever you may be leading, the fact that you are the designated leader, be it the ambassador, the general, whatever, doesn't necessarily mean, probably doesn't mean, 
that you are the smartest person in the room, and you're certainly not the expert on all subjects. You cannot deliver uh, if you go around thinking that you're the one that has to know everything. You can't do that. And so you've got to be prepared to tap into the qualities of the people that are around you. Uh, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you also have to be an outstanding role model. Uh, you have to demonstrate personal integrity. You have to show a willingness to work as hard or harder than anybody else in the organization. Uh, but you also have to be more than willing to acknowledge and recognize the hard work of others that are around you. You have to have clarity of mission. What is it that you're about? What are you trying to accomplish? What do you need to accomplish it? Uh, where are you headed? And I, this has already been said, but I'll, I'll reiterate this point as well. Look around this room, and I hope over the next three weeks uh, you will recognize that everybody in this room is a potential resource for what you want to accomplish, whatever that may be for your country. And as was mentioned by the Deputy Assistant Secretary this morning, you are becoming part of a much bigger network that you can tap into uh, as a resource. Uh, I was told uh, a little while ago that there are now something like 7,000 graduates of various ACSS programs. That is an, an enormous leadership resource. And let me just mention one quick story, uh, which is not about Africa, but nonetheless, I think it is applicable. When I first came to the Africa Center as the deputy director, uh, there was an Air Force officer, a three-star general, uh, who was in command of the National Defense University. And he was very proud of telling the story of a Ukrainian officer who was a very recent graduate of the National War College. And he had gone back to Ukraine right at the time of the Orange Revolution, just as that was starting. Um, and one night, one of his former professors uh, at the National War College uh, got, a, got a phone call from this colonel uh, in Ukraine. And the colonel said, I have been placed in command of the units that, have, that are charged with protecting the most important governor, uh, government buildings uh, in Kiev. And I have been told to protect them even if I have to shoot civilians on sight. And he was very disturbed by that order. He did not want to have to carry that order out. So he sought the advice of his professor. And they talked about it for a while. And the professor learned uh, that the order had come from a political individual in the government, not through his chain of command. And the advice of the professor was, go back to your chain of command and get direction from the proper people. He went back uh, to the chain of command. Uh, the earlier order was countermanded, uh, and a lot of bloodshed was prevented. So I'm not saying necessarily get on the phone in the middle of the night to your ACSS uh, <laughs> faculty member, but talk to each other. You are tremendous resources for each other. Nancy, story. do you want to chime in on that? I was going to pick up on that uh, and and uh, ask uh, if uh, Go ahead. yeah, and maybe this is where your your thought was going. But uh, let me add this into it. Uh, you know, we all uh, exist in you know, contexts where our, our leaders are sometimes not aligned uh, with what uh, it would appear to us could be the vision or the mission uh, for our unit, our organization, uh, the responsibility that we're charged with uh, from a professional standpoint. 
you know, and uh, you know, sometimes clarity comes uh, through you know, uh, reverting to chain of command. Sometimes the chain of command is part of the challenge, you know, if we're candid about it. And so uh, I wondered if there, there's any words of wisdom about how to be in the middle of a structure and uh, not have uh, the enabling environment or the same strategic visionary leadership above you, you know, I, and, and how to navigate uh, those moments or instances. I do have a story, a personal story about that, and then I'd like to talk about another valued one at another stories. Um, I was a very, very proud civil servant. I rose in the ranks and worked for Democratic and Republican administrations. I was proud to serve my government and truly one of the proudest things that I've ever done while earning the government's paycheck was to help establish with an incredible team of people, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. After that, um, I was asked, it was 2003, 2004, um, and the Pentagon leadership was trying to figure out what was next for Nancy Walker. And I was asked to set up and direct a task force for then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld on US-Iraqi detainee policy right before the pictures from the Abu Ghraib prison came out. And I looked myself in the mirror and said I couldn't do that. I thought that the way that was handled did not serve our men and women in uniform and that I did not feel that I could be part and parcel of defending those kinds of those decisions. So with a discussion with my husband and kids, I chose to resign a senior civilian leadership position in the United States Department of Defense. I told my kids that I had washed dishes to pay for college and I would rather do that than do something where I could not look myself in the mirror and feel that I was doing an honorable job. Was it easy? No. In discussions with a former boss, whom you all know, my former under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Walt Slocum, a man who was a friend, who is a friend and was a mentor. And many years later, he said, you sh he said, I'm sorry you didn't stay. He said, I completely respect your decision. He said, I'm sorry you didn't stay because I believed in you when you worked for me and I believed you could have made a difference. And then we had a long discussion about that. And I love and respect this man and mentor. But at the end of the discussion, he said, I understand why you decided what you did. And I think that's really important. Um, was my decision made easier because my husband earned enough money to pay for my family to survive? Yes. Had I been a single mom without a job, would I have made the same decision? Yes. And I think that is also part of leadership. I have a completely different story if we're ready to jump on. We were thinking about things where General Fulford said you need to be bold, as Ambassador Chavez said, you need to lead by example. One of the things we had to do in 2003, we had a, se a seminar, a strategic leadership seminar in Dakar for ECOWAS ministers of foreign affairs, ministers of defense, and chiefs of defense with senior representatives from the United States government, from the British government, the French government, as well as our then European command. And the night before, this was in July of 2003, the situation in Liberia was not good. ECOWAS was contemplating intervention. And the night before, and our team had worked and put together a forward thinking, how can we get these amazing ministers together and, and step back from the crisis of the day and think about where we, they, all together wanted to look at ECOWAS's future. The night before the seminar started, Dr. Monde Moyangwa, who was the then dean, and I were paid a visit by uh, then Foreign Minister Nano Kufuado, current president of Ghana, and Mohamed Ibn Chambas, the executive director of ECOWAS, who said, Nancy, so sorry. We've got a lot going on. We're going to have to pull all the foreign ministers from your seminar tomorrow. We need to talk about ECOWAS planning. And this is the value that I want to talk about, which is be bold and be flexible. And I said, no, you don't. How can we help you? And we scrapped our whole program. We were flexible. And we said, Mr. Chambas, Minister Okufuado, 
what do you want us to do for you? My team stayed up all night and we set up an incredibly productive three-day planning session that culminated in ECOWAS's intervention in Liberia. I was unbelievably proud of our team. I was in awe of the leadership and strategic thinking and passion and, and pure political strength shown by the countries in ECOWAS who are committing their troops, the lives of their men and women, men largely in uniform, to intervene. And values, I would like to think that I led by example in showing that you can start over, that you can be flexible, and that you can be responsive. Um, and it was, a, it was an amazing program. One of our facilitators at the time, an amazing woman named Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, was a facilitator who then stepped back and was a quiet resource person at this very um, seminar. But how to be a leader? Listen, respond, and as Carl and Peter said, be bold and be principled. General Fulford, can we put you on the spot for an example of when your your uh, uh, leadership above you was maybe not uh, where you thought they needed to be in terms of strategic vision or focus? And uh, how did you handle that? Or what words of uh, wisdom would you have for colleagues as they you know, uh, maybe some of them encounter a similar you know, situation in their career? Well. As, as I said before, I grew up in a military culture and I began my, uh, my uh, career here in the Vietnam era when we were in at war in that country, a very divisive time in our nation where uh, leaders and, and civilian agencies were not necessarily in support of, of the effort. Uh, we as, as soldiers did not have the respect of our nation at that time. Uh, and that's an important thing, and I'll talk about that later when I have a chance. But uh, that's changed vastly. Uh, I think our nation now does support and, and, and uh, provide the degree of respect for its military that we would like to see. Uh, that's important for any nation to have that that uh, respect uh, going forward. Um, I was blessed throughout with good leaders. Uh, the question was, can I give an example of a time when, uh, when, as a as a middle level, uh, I didn't agree and or wasn't supportive or had different visions, and, and yes, uh, that occurs always. Uh, and what you do as a leader is, is you try your best to persuade those above you uh, of the value of your vision and your program, um, and if you can't, then, then you salute and you do what you're told, or as Nancy just laid out for you, if you can't do that, then it's time for you to make a statement and, and walk away. Uh, the key term that I used for myself and uh, I used for my son, which I just had an opportunity to promote to Brigadier General last Friday in the Marine Corps, uh, and for other friends that I work with uh, throughout my, my life is keep your honor clean. Uh, that's a verse from the Marine Corps hymn. Uh, and I've used that whenever I've been providing advice to others around me. Do what you are required to do, do what you can do, but in all cases, remember to keep your honor clean because that's yours. And if it's ever stained, you'll never get it back. So keep your honor clean has been, been my phrase that I've used. Uh, and fortunately, 
uh, I have worked for people who respected that and who sought to mentor me and give me opportunities to grow. Uh, so I don't really have that, that story or anecdote of a violent disagreement with seniors. Uh, I've been very fortunate with the talent and the respect of the men above me and women uh, throughout my life. Well, I'd like to recount a situation where uh, the American constitutional system worked the way it should uh, so that I could avoid such uh, a confrontation. Um, I spent uh, most of the earliest years of my foreign service career in West Africa, uh, but in uh, 1988, I was offered the opportunity to go to South Africa uh, as the American Consul General in Johannesburg. Um, you'll all recall, I'm sure, that 1988 was a particularly ugly period in South Africa, then still under the apartheid regime. Um, I had been interested in the issues of Southern Africa, and particularly so South Africa, for many, many years, and so I jumped at the opportunity uh, to go to South Africa at that time. Um, I would not have found it as interesting uh, an opportunity just a few years before. Uh, as some of you will recall, uh, if you followed our history with respect to South Africa, I, under the Reagan administration, there had been an effort to vote uh, some pretty stiff sanctions against South Africa, and President Reagan vetoed those. And our Congress overrode that visa, uh, uh, veto uh, in a strong expression uh, of the view of the American people that we could no longer uh, tolerate the government in South Africa in the way that we had been doing. So fortunately for me, by the time I arrived in January of 1988, uh, we were pursuing a very different approach to the situation in South Africa, and I had the opportunity to be a part of that. My principal role uh, in that was that I was assigned to be one of our mission's uh, primary outreach uh, in, uh, officers uh, to the various elements of the opposition, many of whom were based uh, in uh, Johannesburg. And we had many incidents that I could point to that built uh, the kind of confidence that we needed with the opposition, but I would mention one in particular. In September of 1988, three members of the internal opposition escaped from prison and where did they go? They went straight to the American Consulate General in Johannesburg and sought refuge, which we gave to them for five weeks. I don't think they would have done that two years earlier uh, under uh, the circumstances that then prevailed. Uh, but we, we offered them hospitality and protection for five weeks. Uh, we got to meet uh, and deal with an awful lot of their allies. Uh, to develop relationships, uh, which I think served us very well in the future uh, as the opposition to apartheid gained uh, a new level of confidence uh, in the representatives of the United States government. Great. Uh, thank you. That's a, a powerful story of uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of opportunities and uh, uh, following uh, uh, how our constitutional process worked uh, to come down, uh, as we now know, on, uh, of course, on the right side of, of that uh, uh, situation and, and long-standing uh, challenge for the country of South Africa. Um, I have other questions about strategy and institutions, which are, uh, uh, in addition to leadership, uh, the three elements that we're going to emphasize over and over again in terms of um, uh, effective security sector governance uh, as we continue through our seminar. But um, maybe we'll pause here and uh, see if uh, colleagues uh, would like to start uh, posing uh, uh, a
a question or two directly as well uh, in terms of uh, taking advantage of uh, the expertise and uh, the experience that we have uh, with us. This is a conversation we'll continue into the afternoon uh, into our next plenary session uh, on strategic leadership and uh, uh, add uh, to these experiences uh, some, some others. Yeah, so uh, at this point, uh, if you wave your hand at me, uh, I might call on uh, two or three <coughs> colleagues uh, at a time, and uh, we'll collect those thoughts and questions, uh, and then we'll turn back uh, uh, to the panel here uh, to see uh, uh, what, uh, what words of wisdom and uh, advice uh, they can offer. That is a good question, and as you, uh, as you uh, so rightly describe, the Vietnam War was very unpopular here, uh, and, and those of us who participated in it, though we participated at the command of our leadership uh, and thought we were doing what our nation wanted us to do, uh, we wound up being protested against and uh, it was a very difficult time, uh, the most difficult time of my almost 40 years in the Marine Corps. Uh, I contrast that to Desert Storm, the war to liberate Kuwait. Uh, by that time, uh, the era of Vietnam had passed in our nation, and our leaders worked very hard to make sure that our nation understood what we were doing and why we were doing it. And I think that's the, the key lesson learned out of your question. Uh, if we hide things from our population, if we try to deceive our population in, in, in going to war or going to a fight, then eventually those things are going to come out and the population is not going to support Contrast that to Desert Shield, Desert Storm, where our nation's leaders worked very hard to make sure that our nation understood what we were doing and why we were doing it and the limits on the activity in which we were involved. Uh, I came home from Vietnam uh, as a young lieutenant uh, to protest. People were trying to burn holes in my uniforms with their cigarettes and spitting at me as I walked through the airport. I came home from Desert Shield, and in the middle of the night, taking a bus uh, back to our home base, for more than 100 miles, people were lining the highways with torches welcoming us home. Uh, and the difference is the support uh, that we received from the population, and we received that support because our leaders took the time to make sure that the population understood what we were doing and why we were doing it and why it was important for the security of our nation. Uh, in the Vietnam era, we considered the media as part of the enemy. Uh, we saw them making statements, doing things that were detrimental to our goals. Uh, after Vietnam, we learned the lesson that we needed to uh, work with, talk with, engage in the media so that we could help them understand and get their support. In Desert Storm, uh, we had a great number of, of media representatives on the ground with us. They, they, they understood we were open as to what our goals were, what we were trying to accomplish. They understood and in many cases uh, undertook some of the risk associated with, with combat. So yes, the policy changed with regard to how we dealt with the media and whether or not they were enemy or whether or not they were friends. And that's an important distinction that, that you, you captured. Thank you. I'd like to build a little on that and I as a I'm not having worked as a journalist I'm not comfortable being called a friend or an enemy <laughs> my friend but I think that what General Fulford said the media needs to be transparent and the military needs to be transparent the government needs to be transparent 
it doesn't mean that the government sees the media as a propaganda tool, but that things are explained. But part and parcel of all of that is having a well-educated public uh, who can understand that countries face difficult choices and who can understand it's the government's responsibility to make the case to the public what is in our national interest. And I think the government did a very bad job of it through the media and through other means during Vietnam. Um, another aspect of the public's trust in a government's decision to go to war, and it's not the men and women in uniform who make that decision, it's the political leadership who make that decision. But another way that the public trusts that is because they might know someone, a member of their family, a member of their community, their church, their synagogue, their mosque, their association. And that's something that I worry about in our country now. We do not have, there are very, very few people who serve in uniform. And there are many folks who have absolutely no idea what is involved when young men and women are sent to fight a war. Um, it leads to a, la a larger discussion of national service, civilian and military, which one could have for hours. But part of it is having a well-educated public in understanding the goals of the political goals of a nation. I would just add to that that Nancy referred to having a well-educated public. I think even in this country, we are still not sufficiently educated mm -hmm. about who makes the decision that we go to war or not, or deploy our military mm -hmm. in any fashion. Uh, that is not ultimately the decision of our military. That is a political decision made by political leadership. Uh, and I think that many of the things that happened during the, the um, Vietnam period demonstrated a particular ignorance of that. Uh, the fact that American uh, personnel in uniform were spat upon and otherwise uh, vilified was uh, a reflection of the fact that the American people didn't understand that their political leadership had made the decision to go to Vietnam, to stay in Vietnam, and to conduct ourselves in the way that we did. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, to some degree, that is still lacking in the United States today. Uh, I, I've had, I did not serve in uniform, but I had the pleasure of working with a lot of uh, our country's best uh, military leadership I, and I know that uh, they will express their opinions uh, in, within the chain of command. If they don't think something is right, they will say it. Uh, and, in, and in extremis, uh, if they cannot accept uh, an order, they will resign. But most often what they will do is say, when the ultimate decision is made by political leadership, they uh, salute and they go out and do it to the best of their ability. Great, uh, great uh, uh, conversation to, to help unpack uh, some of these key concepts and uh, to begin uh, to clarify that it's an ongoing process uh, for any society uh, to have its relationship between its uh, security actors uh, and its population. And we have certainly been through a number of phases uh, in American life and continue uh, uh, our own journey in this regard. Uh, it's not something we arrive at and we're done, uh, and it stays that way uh, uh, forever. I, I should preface my remarks about Vietnam by saying I was a protester. Uh, <laughs> but I chose to do it by uh, supporting various political candidates within our constitutional system. I was a campaigner for Gene McCarthy back in 1968. Um, but I think a fundamental problem with our, uh, our situation in Vietnam was uh, that our government was never able to articulate to the American people why we were doing this. Why did this really pose a threat uh, to our values, our interests? Uh, there was a vague story about how all the dominoes were going to fall and suddenly we were going to be confronting uh, communists in Hawaii and so on. And, and 
that was not very widely believed. Uh, and it, it just, it, you, you've got to, j just like we've heard referred to before, uh, you've got to be clear about your mission if you're going to lead, regardless of what the level is. You've got to be clear what the mission is. And, and I don't believe that we were ever very clear uh, about what our mission was uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and I could mention a few other examples along the way, too, but uh, I won't elaborate on that. Um, to the other question, uh, I think the, there's always an enormous gap, particularly when we talk about Africa uh, and what our engagement ought to be in Africa. Uh, the level of knowledge amongst the American people uh, about Africa is very, very low. Um, and that's the base from which our elective, elected officials work. Uh, there's plenty of people here in Washington and other places within the U.S. government who have real expertise, but they don't, uh, they don't account for much of a mass uh, within American society. I'll just try to briefly address both your questions uh, with, with my limited knowledge and understanding. Um, I think there's a difference between public opinion and public information. Uh, I think a leader's responsibility is to help shape public opinion. Uh, and that means you have to use education or information or powers of persuasion uh, to help public opinion understand the decisions that you make. Uh, issues of security and strategy and national welfare should not be made uh, on uh, public opinion uh, polls that change radically over time. Uh, I think good leaders, as we said earlier, have the vision, uh, they have the moral character, and they try to build on what they believe is right. If, if they are firm and passionate in those beliefs, they will help form public opinion uh, in order to do what they think is necessary. Uh, but I would, I, would, I would not rely too heavily on public opinion. Uh, it's, it's too, uh, it varies too frequently and, and too widely. Um, in terms of, of, of your question, uh, I think it's a matter of priorities. Um, we here in this nation, as you and yours and all over the Africa continent, have different priorities. Uh, and as you try to, different leaders try to apply those resources, which are always limited, uh, to meet those priorities, uh, they often come up short. Uh, so again, I think you need to be focused. Uh, leaders need to to believe in themselves, and 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 continue to press for a better day tomorrow, based on their vision. Actually, on public opinion, um, I completely agree with General Fulford. Political leaders should not be led by the latest of public opinion poll. Um, and I think that back in Vietnam, that public opinion was shaped and political leaders heard the despair and the frustration and the sorrow over the US involvement in Vietnam. But the news sources, it was the evening news with Walter Cronkite. We did not have social media and cable news 24 hours a day. And the world has changed dramatically. Um, so I think the, the problem with the way our life has sped up, it's much easier to respond to the immediate. And I think that's one of the great challenges right now for leadership is you have to maintain your focus on your strategic vision um, and not be distracted by all of the 
the stuff that keeps happening. Um, and that's not always easy because it's not, as you said, part of being a leader is making decisions that are not necessarily popular and having the backbone to do that. Maybe um, something that I'll challenge uh, uh, the facilitators and uh, our colleagues uh, coming after to, to continue to help us unpack is what is the, the distinction between public opinion and popularity of decisions and public accountability oh. and ensuring that you know, uh, the nation's security services are you know, uh, truly reflecting the will of the people and uh, accountable back uh, to the people. We have certain institutions in our country you know, through which that gets mediated uh, in a normal basis uh, through our Congress, uh, et cetera. But uh, I think there's an important uh, uh, element for us to understand there uh, of public accountability uh, and popularity and uh, uh, broader uh, public uh, awareness of, of what is happening and why. Thank you all for these really interesting, challenging, and provocative um, questions. How do you deal with opposition, and how do you convince people, and what are some of the tools? Mm -hmm. Let me first say, my decision to quit the government wasn't an easy one, but you also have to make a distinction between implementing something you think isn't a great idea, but you can live with, versus something where you really can't look yourself in the mirror and go to work. That's just one thing. In terms of how to deal with opposition, as General Fulford said, you make your case up the chain of command, and you make your best arguments, and you put your smartest positions out, and you make the case. And if the leadership decides to do something you don't agree with, you do the military or civilian equivalent of salute smartly and march. However, and not a however, that's just simply, that's what you do, and that's what it is in a chain of command. But sometimes, how do you persuade people? You have to know the people for whom you are working. And you need to know how they digest information. You need to know how they think about things. One thing, you never, you don't embarrass your leadership. You don't say, if the big boss says, I want to do X, Y, and Z, and you think that's just dumb. You don't say, hey, big boss, that's dumb. Because then you will not be listened to. Part of it is establishing your credibility. I worked for a wonderful Assistant Secretary of Defense. Um, when he wasn't a political appointee, he was an attorney. He liked words, and he was very proud, and he knew nothing. He was the first to say, I know nothing about Africa, Nancy. You guys have to get me smart. But then he had all kinds of ideas. Some of his ideas were not really practical. But God forbid that you should say that in the staff meeting. So I learned with this particular person he liked very clear words, written very beautifully, and I would make an appointment to have one-on-one -on -one time with him and make my argument. He was not embarrassed in front of anybody. He came around and said, OK, I'm persuaded. And then it all went away. Did it always work? No, but most of the time it worked. So that worked for me in this case with this particular boss on these topics. But part of your challenge is to understand the people for whom you are working and how they think about information, how, what their, how their ego is involved, who the other players are. And you need to think strategically how you can be most persuasive. Uh, I don't want to forget your question on leadership and learning. Um, I am an avid reader. And I read about leaders uh, throughout the world's history and what their strengths and weaknesses are and try to learn from that. Uh, I'm not alone. I think uh, our Secretary of Defense, Mattis, who was a young lieutenant of mine years ago, uh, has one of the largest libraries on leadership uh, and is very proud of that, and he can talk to you about uh, Roman leaders and Greek leaders and Corinthian leaders, uh, and and he doesn't talk about it from an from an academic perspective, but from a lessons learned perspective. What did this leader do? How did he do it, or she do it, and and what then is are those traits that I can incorporate into my leadership style. So I, I think you hit on a good point there that, that 
I want to emphasize and that leaders have to be learners. Mm -hmm. You learn from others, you learn by reading, you learn by observing, uh, and then uh, you evaluate uh, those traits that make you a better leader. That doesn't mean that you have to try to mimic someone. Uh, that usually comes off uh, false. Uh, but you evaluate a strength or a weakness, and then you ask yourself, how can I incorporate that into my leadership style? And you learn from it. Um, your point, I want to I want to go back a couple of things. Uh, resigning, in my view, is the last step and has to be uh, uh, in order to keep your honor clean. Uh, we have an example of a of a man, a famous man in our country who was the Secretary of Navy and he had a disagreement with the Secretary of Defense over how many ships were in the budget. And uh, so he resigned his position. Uh, that made the newspaper for about two days and then nobody remembered who he was or what he resigned over or what the issue was. Uh, so the importance there is is that that you don't be too quick in that decision. Uh, the other thing in in dealing with with your superior, uh, most likely you have a lot of common goals. So seek out those things that you agree with with your senior, and try to reinforce and show him or her that you're on board and you're doing what they want you to do. Uh, and as you build a trust and confidence in that leader, as, as, as uh, Dr. Walker talked earlier, uh, then they will become more receptive to your views on perhaps those areas where you don't agree. I'll give you an example that, that is a little bit close to home perhaps with you all. Uh, at least it's on your continent. I don't think members are here. I was asked while I was the director of the Africa Center to to be part of the negotiating team at at, uh, at uh, Navasha to end the conflict in in Sudan. Uh, that was a huge opportunity, and I was very grateful for it. <clears throat> uh, during the negotiations. Uh, a couple of things became evident. Number one, we were stopping what had been a long history of mass killings. So that was a good thing. The bad thing is that uh, uh, there was very little substance to the agreement on how it was going to be carried out. And in my view, it was not going to last. Our country <clears throat> wanted the publicity of facilitating an agreement. Uh, I think both North and South Sudan had different objectives. Uh, we were building our support behind one individual, uh, and we knew very little about the, the depth of the issues uh, on either side of that conflict. And so, we, we fostered an agreement that to this day has not, in my view, uh, been very forthcoming because we were eager to have publicity where leaders signed this peace agreement, but there was no substance to it. There was no way to bring about the value of peace in that region. So I view that as, as with mixed feelings. Number one, we did stop, the agreement did stop a, a war that was horrific. Uh, two, uh, here we are 15 years later and we still have huge problems that we were not able to resolve. Some of this may sound like a broken record, but um, 
the uh, resignation is sometimes a tool that one has to use. Um, but you need to be aware that it's probably a tool that you can only ever, ever use once. Uh, the second time you do it, it has no credibility. <laughs> Um, I would also uh, want to underline what Dr. Walker said about knowing the people that you're interacting with. Who is it that you are influencing? What's their level of expertise? What's their receptivity to information? Uh, how do you address them? Uh, and this goes not just not uh, not just for people who are your superiors, but people who may be working under you. Um, an example, uh, in 19, uh, excuse me, 20, uh, 2001, uh, I went to Sierra Leone as ambassador. Uh, the war, the, the indiscriminate violence that had been going on in Sierra Leone for over a decade uh, was still not completely over. Um, and there was a great deal of nervousness in Washington and also within my mission about the security environment. Um, the, I, I, having served in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone before, uh, was pretty confident about how we could operate within that, that country, but that was not a widely held view. Um, you got to understand that if you're an officer of an embassy overseas, you cannot possibly do your work by sitting in the office. If you're not out of the office, if you're not out of the capital, if you're not out understanding firsthand the situation in which you're working, you're not doing your work. So how was I to overcome all of these uh, uncertainties about the security situation? Um, I un came to understand that particularly in Washington, there were some people that ha had to be flooded with information. They had to know everything we were doing in order to feel confident about how we were doing it. Uh, and so I personally and various officers in, in the embassy were constantly intent in uh, contact uh, with the right people in Washington to give them all the information that they needed. But also, at the same time, I knew who the Secretary of State was at the time. It was Colin Powell. And Colin Powell had been crystal clear to every ambassador that I knew during that period. He said, you are in charge of your missions. Make decisions. Don't keep asking Washington what you ought to do. Uh, and if you act in that fashion with integrity and with good reasoning, we will back you. So while I was flooding Washington with a lot of information about a lot of things, I was also doing a lot of things which either they learned about long after the fact uh, or in a few cases, never learned about. Um, and that comes from knowing the environment in which you're operating, knowing the people that you're working with. Um, I started my African experience as a Peace Corps volunteer on the shores of Lake Chad. Uh, I lived in a small town, 2,000 people for a while, and then in a small village uh, where there were fewer than 20 huts. Uh, and one of the lessons I took away from that is the ability of Africans to put in the time, be inclusive, talk and talk until you find a solution to the problem. Now, I know that that is not easily transferable uh, from the village level up to a national level where you're talking about bringing often many very diverse groups together. Um, but I think there's a common African ability to sit down and talk sometime endlessly. 
uh, but nonetheless to come out on the other end uh, with some kind of accommodation, if not the perfect solution. In our Declaration of Independence, the Founding Fathers that you talked about wrote a very interesting sentence. They said, we're declaring independence to end tyranny and to create a more perfect union. Um, certainly Africans know about tyranny uh, from outsiders and from insiders. Uh, and that's an ongoing battle. Um, creating a more perfect union is a long-term fight. Uh, you talked about from the African perspective, uh, we don't have a perfect union that I can stand before and say the United States should be your model, uh, nor does any other nation in the world. Uh, we're made up of people who have visions and goals, and striving for that more perfect union is an ongoing effort that we all have to work for. Um, and then that comes back to a point, if you will let me digress just a second, that I want to make. Um, I think one of the big in, in it, biggest enemies to peace and security is corruption. Uh, we certainly have it here in the United States and other nations around the world, and as we're trying to create a more perfect union, we've got to find ways to end corruption. Uh, as I travel throughout Africa, uh, I was interested in a phrase that, that I heard frequently, and that phrase was an acceptable level of corruption. And some of you are smiling because you know that in your country there is an acceptable level of corruption. I think as leaders, there's no such thing. Uh, you have to keep your honor clean and you have to despise corruption in all phases because it is a cancer. It will eat at your nation and it will destroy it. So I encourage you to not look for that acceptable level, but to keep your honor clean in all that you do. It's my turn to echo the words of my very wonderful and distinguished colleagues and old friends. Um, I agree with everything you all have said on this one. On the values, a good leader does admit when she or he is wrong. And I understand that it's difficult in the military context at times, but part of it is, as Carl said, keeping your honor clean. And admitting you're wrong empowers the people who work for you to realize that you too can learn. And that's a powerful, powerful message as a leader. So I think that's something that is really, really important. What do you do when your vision transcends? We work to form a more perfect union. And one of the things that in this today has been for me wonderful to see is to see how far the Africa Center has come to see all of you here to know that there are 7,000 colleagues to whom you can turn and from whom you can learn and we should all be very proud that we're here learning from each other and it's been a pleasure to share a few minutes of learning with my distinguished colleagues with all of you this morning thank you uh, uh, Dr. Walker, uh, General Fulford, uh, Ambassador Chavez, uh, uh, thank you for uh, launching us on uh, a, a very uh, thought-provoking uh, and insightful conversation on strategic leadership. You know, we put a number of dimensions and attributes uh, and uh, techniques uh, on the table you know, that we'll continue to discuss this afternoon, both in our next plenary session General Aguay has his work uh, cut out for him, but I know he's up uh, to the challenge. Uh, and uh, his uh, co-panelist, uh, Dr. Miyonga, will be with us as well uh, to, to particularly, uh, I think, uh, take us further into the African context uh, uh, indeed, uh, and to, to uh, go further on the questions already 
uh, put forward as well as uh, to continue to uh, uh, unpack uh, what uh, strategic leadership uh, can mean at all various levels and facets. So please join me uh, in thanking our distinguished uh, panel this morning and our uh, former directors of the Africa Center who have uh, given us uh, this institution through their strategic leadership and vision you know, that we've been able to, to take forward and uh, we hope continue together to be uh, an ongoing platform for exchange and dialogue on the African continent. Thank you.